I think it's safe to say that no one really wants to be a victim of crime, right? Anyone who's ever had their pocket picked or their house broken into can tell you how, even if not much is actually taken, something like that, that can leave you feeling violated, vulnerable, angry, upset. Now, imagine there was a particular kind of crime so violating and traumatic that it left almost all those who were subjected to it with at least some symptoms of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Symptoms like nightmares, flashbacks, insomnia, chronic irritability, emotional numbness, difficulty concentrating. Imagine this crime was so serious, it left many who survived it with depression, chronic pain or suicidal thoughts. Imagine this crime adversely affected relationships, careers, livelihoods, families, communities. Imagine some of its impacts were really long-term, even lifelong. Now imagine that one in every five women living in this country alone today and one in every 25 adult men had experienced some form of this crime since they turned 16 years old. Just take a moment to maybe reflect on your own life and how many women alone that would represent. And then imagine that as well as this, one in every 13 adults, again, just in England and Wales, that's 2.4 million women and 709,000 men, had been subjected to some form of this crime before they turned 16, when they were children. One in 13 of all of us. And now imagine that less than a fifth of all of those victims of this serious traumatic crime, which, don't forget, may have left them with all these wide-ranging, long-lasting health and social impacts, imagine that less than one in five of those people ever reported what had happened to them to the police. And imagine that some of the reasons why so many of these people chose not to report this serious crime against them, the four out of five, was that, that, was that they feared they might not be believed. Or even, bearing in mind what we've just said about it pretty much being a given that none of us actually wants to be the victim of any crime, that they were worried it might be implied that actually they did want this horrible thing to happen to them. And even, really, that it was kind of their own fault. Imagine that one of the reasons so many of these people didn't report to the police was that if they'd been drinking alcohol when this thing had happened to them, they suspected it would be considered even more their own fault. And yet, bafflingly, obtusely, if the person who'd committed the crime against them had been drinking alcohol, it might be considered less their fault the person who actually committed the crime. Or even just that if they'd been drinking and the perpetrator had, people might acknowledge that what had happened to them was bad, yes, but at the same time kind of hold their hands up and say, well, they had both been drinking, so it's a bit of a grey area, you know? Now, that's thoroughly daft, right? I mean, if I'd had a few, uh, and you'd had a few, and then you shot me, would anyone really turn around and say, well, they were both pretty drunk, so who can really say whose fault that was? And now imagine that of that roughly 20% of people who did report this crime to the police, imagine that of that one in five, just one 0.4% of them ever saw the perpetrator prosecuted. Not convicted, not sent to prison, just legally prosecuted for what they had done. So basically, what I'm saying is, 
Imagine a crime so serious that it had wide-ranging, lifelong impacts on individuals, their health, work, every aspect of their lives, their friends and family, and that the overwhelming majority of people perpetrating that crime were just walking around free. But of course, we don't have to imagine. When I wrote this, I almost put, sadly, we don't have to imagine, but it's not sad. Sad is not the right word. It is outrageous. We shouldn't be feeling sad about it. We should be feeling angry. We should be raging because there are millions of victims and survivors of child sexual abuse, rape, and all forms of sexual violence living in England and Wales alone right now, and they are being failed. So why? Why is this happening? Is it the fault of the law on sexual violence and abuse? Is it unclear, badly written, difficult to understand, maybe? Not really. I mean, arguably, any legislation can be strengthened, and there are undoubtedly legitimate criticisms that can be made of the Sexual Offences Act 2003. But it's pretty clear on what sexual offences are. There are different categories of sexual offence within the Act, but they can basically be summarised as sexual acts committed by person A against person B without person B's consent. Ah, so maybe it's that word, consent. Maybe that's what's not clear. After all, we often hear people refer to consent as a grey area, don't we? Maybe the lawmakers didn't take the time or the effort to clearly define sexual consent and left us with a fuzzy, difficult-to-grasp concept. Again, not really. The Sexual Offences Act 2003 is actually pretty sure of itself on consent. It says that someone consents to sex or sexual activity when they agree by choice and have the freedom and capacity to make that choice. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but I get that. So if I've been kidnapped, imprisoned, physically forced or overpowered, I don't have the freedom to make a choice. If I'm very drunk, or I've been drugged, or if I've taken drugs willingly, I don't have the capacity to make a choice. If I'm under the age of consent, 16 in this country, likewise, I don't have the capacity to make that choice to consent to sex. If I'm terrified for my life or for the lives of those I love, no freedom to consent. And that includes, of course, if I'm in a coercive, controlling relationship. No freedom. And if I'm asleep or unconscious, I have neither the freedom nor the capacity to make that choice about consent. So far, so straightforward. And the law helps us out even more with this by being clear that someone might consent to one sexual act, but not another in any specific situation. For example, to vaginal but not anal penetration. That they might consent to sex with conditions, for example, with but not without a condom. And that they can change their minds and withdraw consent or lose the capacity to consent at any point. You might be familiar with the uh, popular tea analogy when it comes to this. And if you're not, I recommend that you look it up. But the general gist is this. Just because you made me a cup of tea doesn't mean I have to drink it. I may have said, I really wanted it, but I've gone off the idea. Or fallen asleep. Or I uh, asked for it with sugar in, and you forgot the sugar, and I really only can stomach it with sugar, and so on and so forth. And in not one of these situations would you go ahead and pour that tea down my throat anyway. So if we find it easy to understand the concept of consent in, in some situations, why do we find it, why do we insist on claiming that it's complicated when it comes to sexual situations? <laughs>
The law really has covered all of these bases when it comes to sexual consent. It's really clear that you never can assume that I want tea. I may be famous for my love of tea. I may taste or sell tea for a living. I may have enjoyed a lovely cup of your tea just this morning, or we may have had drunk tea together literally thousands of times before. But you have to check with me every time. You have to take steps to be confident that I want your tea. And even after I've started drinking it, if I suddenly get very still or very quiet, because those can actually be signs of real fear, shock, and trauma, you should be double-checking that I'm okay and that I still actively, positively, enthusiastically want that tea. So, if the law's pretty clear on all of this, why isn't it working? Why do only a fifth of those who experience sexual violence and abuse even feel that they can report it to the police? And why do only 1.4% of those who do report rape to the police ever receive any semblance of criminal justice? Is it because rape and sexual violence have elements in common with something nice that many of us really enjoy, that is, consensual sex? And therefore, we find it difficult to distinguish between the two somehow. Hmm, I don't think so. Because I really like swimming. And it happens in water, same as drowning does. But I don't call drowning swimming without breathing. I call it drowning. And I understand drowning to be bad. And despite the superficial similarities between the two, I completely understand it as different and distinct from swimming. So if it's not that, could it be anything to do with the fact that rape and sexual violence and abuse are overwhelmingly perpetrated by men and largely, though by no means solely, against women and children, and that we still live in an overwhelmingly sexist, patriarchal society? Maybe. Because a YouGov poll from December 2018 found that a third of people in Britain think that it isn't usually rape if a woman is pressured into having sex, but there's no physical violence. And according to that same poll, a third of men believe that if a woman has been flirting on a date, it wouldn't generally be rape, even if she hasn't consented to sex. Now, we sometimes refer to these ill-informed beliefs around sexual consent as rape or victim-blaming myths, because like other kinds of myths, they aren't rooted in evidence or even common sense, but they nonetheless have hold and power, and as such, can be extremely dangerous. Because if a third of people believe in these myths, not only believe in them, but are willing to own them in a poll, surely we, that implies that over a third of any given jury will be influenced by them too. Influenced by myths that are directly contrary to the law on sexual violence as it's written, but, will, that, but that will inevitably affect their decision making. And it's not just us ordinary, non-legal folk who are influenced by rape myths either. At rape crisis centres across England and Wales, we have specialist independent sexual violence advocates, or ISVAs, who support those victims and survivors who do report to the police throughout the criminal justice process. And they tell us that these victim-blaming, often sexist rape myths are brought into the courtroom too. Usually by defence barristers, yes, but frequently unchallenged by prosecutors. And all too often, we hear even of judges in both criminal and family courts, the most senior figures in our criminal justice system, articulating rape myths. So the problem then, it would seem, is not with the way the law is written on sexual violence and abuse, 
but with the way the law is applied, or not, as the case may be. And let's just revisit those headline figures from the beginning one more time. One in every 13 adults raped or sexually abused as children. One in every five women and one in every 25 men raped or sexually assaulted as adults. Less than a fifth of all of those people ever feeling able to report to the police. Just 1.4% of those who report rape ever seeing the perpetrator prosecuted. If this was any other crime so serious, with such significant, wide-ranging, diverse consequences, being perpetrated with such impunity, it would be deemed a national emergency. And when we consider this picture alongside the prevalence of rape myths and the fact that most victims and survivors of these traumatic crimes don't have access to the specialist support of a rape crisis centre to help them heal, cope and recover because of chronic historic underfunding of those services, we begin to see that this is not just a failure of criminal justice. It's a monumental failure of social justice. Now, I may not be a lawyer, but I do understand consent, because consent is actually a straightforward concept. And I know that I don't consent to this. Last year, I had the privilege of sitting on a panel at Bradford Literature Festival with Bob Balfour of Survivors West Yorkshire and Sahila Abdullali, author of What We Talk About When We Talk About Rape. Now, I've obviously only been addressing the situation in relation to England and Wales today, but I do recommend that book, not least of all for its diverse range of survivors' testimonies from across the world. In the Q&A at the end of the session, someone asked us, with the situation around rape and sexual violence so bad, both locally and globally, how we want, weren't just angry all of the time. And I said, oh, I am. I am most definitely angry all of the time, but I try to channel that anger into activism, lobbying, awareness raising for change just as all my fellow sexual violence activists and rape crisis sisters do. Because there is no one single simple solution to this overwhelming failure of criminal and social justice for sexual violence and abuse survivors. The approach must be multi-pronged. The shift must be cultural and paradigmatic and we must all demand and be involved with it. Because, don't forget, this affects us all. And to that end, I hope that I leave you with a little bit of anger today too. Angela Davis said, I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. And if this isn't unacceptable, I don't know what is. Thank you.